after examining the dangerous and interesting Alekhan Chatard attack variation in the previous opening video on this channel, today we are going to continue and also finalize our coverage of the 4 bishop g5 variation of the classical French by examining what I consider to be the most robust and objectively the best way for black to meet uh, the 4 bishop g4 move, the so called burn variation with the move 4 d takes e4. I hope you will enjoy it. So if those of you who have been following the channel a bit more regularly know, in the past few opening videos we have been covering the variation of the French defense that arises after the moves e4, e6, d4, d5, knight c3, knight f6 and now bishop to g5, uh, the so called uh, bishop g5 variation of the classical variation that doesn't have its name in itself. And we have been examining various Black's uh, fourth moves uh, in the previous videos, but today I would want to cover the so-called burn variation that arises after the move d takes e4. Now, you might be wondering, hang on, but aren't we taught as beginners that we shouldn't release the tension in the center? Is Aren't we taught that uh, this only gives space to our opponent? Well, yes, this is all true, but taking on e4 has a very, very specific idea. Namely, after knight takes e4, we are claiming that by drawing this knight on e4 and potentially threatening to exchange it at a later point, uh, we are actually benefiting because we have less space, so we naturally want to exchange pieces. So that means that white will have to address it and then lose some time to deal with this threat of exchange. A very similar idea is actually seen one move earlier. Uh, the black can take on e4 already back on move 3, d takes e4. This leads to the so called Rubinstein variation, and it's a very similar uh, idea. And here with the bishop on g4 and knight on f6, we are claiming that this is an even better version because this bishop on g5 can be exposed. For example, at some po moment we will play bishop to e7, and then once the knight jumps, for example, this bishop will be a little bit target, so we can maybe uh, exchange not only the knights, but also the bishops, so which is even more beneficial for black. Now, of course, it's not so, so simple, because this bishop also exerts some pressure, and as we will soon see, the, the, the most critical variation actually involves uh, giving it up. So, you know, as usual in the modern theory, there are both pros and cons, but uh, overall, I think this is a very sensible way of playing for black, and very popular also at the highest level, and in my opinion, this is the best way of meeting this 4 bishop g5 line, and this is the only one that I have actually played myself in two tournament games against 2300 plus rated opposition. So what are Black's options in this position? Well, by far the most common move and the move that we are going to examine in this video is the move bishop to e7, simply breaking up this pin, attacking the knight on e4 and asking white what do they want to do. Now with that being said, there is also the alternative, there is this move knight b to d7 that is kind of overprotecting this knight on f6, not yet for the moment uh, determining the fate of this bishop, and uh, basically, once again, either seeking to play bishop e7, or maybe to uh, play h6, kick this bishop away, and then uh, avoid the doubling on th of the pawns on f6, uh, that can be seen in the main variation of the burn variation. And I have actually played this myself in the game against uh, Arthur Winter, which you can also find on this channel. Uh, this is in general considered to be a more solid approach, uh, because black will remain uh, with less space and uh, uh, not uh, force white to give up the bishop, basically. But uh, yeah, it, it leads to a different type of position than the main one. Now, the reason it will not be covered in this video is because it can also arise via the Rubinstein variation move order. So for example, after in this particular case, after something like knight b to d7, knight f3, knight f6, for example, bishop g5, we can get a very similar or exactly the same position. So this option will be covered in the respective video to devote to the Rubinstein variation, simply because, I don't know, <laughs> I, I thought it was sensible, or you could also say I was lazy when preparing this one. So we play bishop to e7 now, and now of course the question is for white, what uh, should they do? Note by the way that for some reason I'm doing this video from the black perspective, probably because I <laughs> played this as black, so it, this is a line that's dear to my heart. So now of course the question is how should white react, because uh, as you can see the option to defend this uh, knight is not may maybe so good, because then we take we take this bishop and it's not, not problematic. So typically white, what white does is they take on f6 with either piece. And you might be wondering, okay, but isn't it more sensible to take with a knight? But after knight to f6, it turns out that after bishop to f6, uh, 
uh, once again black has uh, white has problem with this bishop on g5 which is why we have drawn it here to begin with and after bishop to f6 queen to f6 knight to f3 usually uh, in a, a different variation uh, getting the queen so early on f6 is not particularly desirable because white might have some bishop to g5 which is annoying however here we have actually exchanged that dark square bishop so our queen will not be disturbed on f6 and this is actually quite nice because we have exchanged two pieces and uh, we have less space and this is very beneficial and slowly we can start preparing to play c5 for example after castles bishop to d3 already c5 happens and in general in all this uh, Rubinstein type of positions where we take on e4, undermining the pawn on d4 with a timely c5 push will be quite thematic. And here we can do so because if d takes e5, we take on b2 and we are more than happy with this exchange. And otherwise, we will maybe take on d4, play knight c6, and so on and so forth. And I think that black has quite a you know solid maybe not, uh, position. Maybe it's also not too easy to play like for a win or or you know because white is also very solid and doesn't have weaknesses. But that's if you are uh, playing these variations with taking on e4, you are more than. Uh, often okay with this turn of events with this of turn of, uh, type of pawn structure where e5 will be open for uh, semi open for white where d5 will be semi open for black and then you take it from there once again not ideal uh that white has this let's say non combative option but uh, it is once again very sound and we equalize without any problem so if white doesn't play with too much ambition i guess we can <laughs> we can play without we should accept it and play without too much ambition too which is not to say that a position like this is like an immediate draw, there's a lot to play for, but it is a little bit, you know, more difficult to play for a win here than, let's say, in a sharp Sicilian. Okay, so that is why, instead of knight f6, white players more commonly they play bishop to f6, and I think this is by far the most ambitious move in the position. Now, you might be wondering, hang on, but aren't we taught as beginners that um, we shouldn't give up our bishops for the knights, that now after uh, black will have a bishop pair after they take on f6, like isn't this all so good for, for black? Well, on general principles, yes, but uh, with the knight on e4 being so dominant uh, and also eyeing this f6 square, it turns out that this is not at all so bad for, for, for white. Because, for example, if we take with bishop to f6, which seems quite logical, uh, it turns out that this is actually not so great for black as you would imagine on the basis of these uh, general principles. Now, it has to be said that even though this is like a more rare move, so the main move here is actually taking with the pawn g takes f6, which is, uh, I will get to this move slide for later. But bishop to f6, even though it is not the main move, it was still played by some very strong players, like two notable French experts, Matthias Bulbaim and a legendary grandmaster of Henny Barev, have both played this move on several occasions. So black doesn't want to compromise the structure and uh, we just want to castle next but white's argument is that, that having the knight on e4 is much more dangerous for black than having let's say the bishop on g5 and white wants to continue in a very uh, queen, queen and fast manner with knight f3 castles queen d2 and now they want to castle long play bishop to d3 and then potentially go h4 g4 and attack our king and also, with the knight on e4, uh, as we have just seen, black's thematic pawn break here is the pawn c5, and here it is a little bit more difficult to achieve because this knight is controlling this square. So what black does here, typically, they play knight to d7. Uh, by the way, note also that, you know, okay, black has the bishop pair, but white can almost whenever take on f6 and eliminate that bishop pair. Of course, it, this is not perhaps the most ambitious, but you know, just I'm just emphasizing this because many people over, uh, over uh, value the importance of the bishop pair and that's not always the case. So here typically play continuous castles long, now b6. And now white has several options. I didn't go into too many details here, like white can play, for example, bishop c4 here. They can even play some queen f4, trying to pressure the uh, bishop on f6 and the pawn on c7. Uh, since this is already a little bit rare, I didn't go too deep. Uh, I will leave it to you to do some of your own investigations if you want, especially since I will be providing you the files. But the, by far the most natural move is the move bishop to d3. Uh, potentially eyeing this h7 square and you know what can be more natural than having the bishop there but now white is potentially ready to start launching the pawns on the king side so we play bishop to b7 h4 
And uh, this is once again the most popular move in this position. It's very sensible. You are preparing the encore square for the knight on g5, and you are creating some uh, threats on the king's side. And also g4, g5 is on reserve. And now, actually, the best move here is to play bishop to e7, uh, simply anticipating that this is coming. So you are kind of removing the bishop from this attack, and also potentially preparing some knight to f6, or e potentially if you want. Now. There is also this move c5 here, but this is not too good here because of a very peculiar reason, and that is the weakness of the d6 square uh, above all, all things. So here knight uh, to g5 first comes, now threatening some sort of knight h7 stuff, or uh, even knight, knight d6 for example, and then knight f7, or there, there are a lot of threats here. And for example, if we play uh, h6 now, now knight d6 comes, which is a very annoying move because it's uh, we really can't take this this knight. For example, takes takes uh, bishop g5. I mean, there is f4, there is also bishop h7. This is not good. But uh, and after knight b, uh, after instead of I mean, if uh, knight b7 is also actually even stronger. Now that I think of it, queen c7, hg5. Yeah, but it it comes to the same, and uh, this is just bad because I don't know bishop e7, rook h3, uh, rook h1 is coming. Yeah, this is obviously very 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 dangerous and borderline lost for 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 black. So we can't really go c5. So that is why we play bishop to e5. Uh, we are preparing knight f6 and also preparing c5 while we are covering the d6 square, which was very relevant in these positions. And now the more popular move here is the move queen to e2, uh, which is has several ideas. Uh, the one is maybe to bring the queen closer to the, uh, to the king side. Uh, it eyes uh, the queen on the, the rook is eyeing uh, the queen on d8. Uh, and now it is difficult to play c5. There are some potential ideas of jumping on g5. And uh, yeah, I think white just has a better version of the regular Rubinstein. Uh, sorry, white has a better version of the regular Rubinstein. And there's, this is, I think, the reason why this variation is not too popular or why taking with the g pawn for black is uh, probably better. Even though, once again, very, very strong players have played it. And I haven't delved too deeply into the intricacies of this line. So if you want to play it, you can investigate a little bit on your own. But with that being said, by far the most common move here is the g takes f6. Um, this is by far the most uh, combative move. Uh, we are kind of uh, ruining our pawn structure, but we are not uh, placing the bishop on an exposed square. We are keeping the option of moving the f pawn forward to kick this knight away. Uh, and we want to gradually use our bishop pair uh, to gain the advantage. And also, it's not necessarily obvious that we want to place the king on the king side. We want to keep it flexible for the moment and go about the development of our pieces with various uh, developing schemes. And after knight to f3, this is like a big, big and a very important position. This is like almost the starting position of the entire burn variation. And here black has a very, very big conceptual choice to make. Because as I have said, the move f5 is very, very, very attractive to make here. And it is nevertheless the most common move in the position. However, if you play f5, uh, what happens here is that you are kicking the knight away from the center. But the drawback is that white has this move knight to c3, uh, where the knight is sitting very nicely and also fighting for the d5 square. Now, before we get to that square, uh, with that continuation, we, let's just examine knight g3 here. Uh, this also makes some sense because in some potential cases there is knight h5, there is also knight f5 sacrifice. But this is not so good because black has immediate liberating push c5. And with the knight on c3, d5 would be possible, but here this is not so good. Uh, and for example, it's important to understand that some d takes c5, queen d1, rook d1, bishop c5 is perfectly great for black because we now have two bishops in a relatively open position. We are happy that we have exchanged queens because in general in this variation black's king is the one that is less safe. So now without the queens uh, this compromised pawn structure is of less significance and the king is in general safer. So black doesn't want to, uh, white doesn't want to take on c5. Uh, white can play c3 here but now we play cd4, knight d4, and for example, bishop d7. And then we play knight to c6, then we move the queen potentially to b6, and then we castle long. So in many, many cases, uh, the king goes actually to, to, to the queen side in these variations because of the compromised uh, g file and, and the king side. And this is one such case. So white shouldn't play too slowly and too timidly, uh, but they should play more energetically. 
Uh, that is why here the main move is bishop to b5. Um, the idea, so the point here is to try to force black to play a piece on d7 and then to play d5 nevertheless. So in, it, because as we have seen, if white doesn't do anything about the tension of these two pawns, then black has a very, very easy game. And this is one reason why I like this burn variation. It kind of gives black the very concrete idea of playing c5. So now you could play king f5, f8 here. This is definitely a possibility, but uh, in this file I didn't go too deeply into it. I mean, you are preventing d5, you are th threatening queen a5. Um, this has been tried in few games and you can explore it further. But the most natural move is bishop to d7, simply uh, attacking this uh, bishop. Bishop to d7. And now white is trying to make an argument that both of these recaptures have their drawbacks. For example, after knight d7, d5 happens, queen a5, c3, queen a6. This is also actually not so terrible because uh, black is preventing castling and also covering uh, e e6 and d6 squares. Um, this is probably around balanced, uh, we are preparing to castle long next, but uh, this is maybe not as ambitious uh, way of handling this position as some others. For example, the move queen to d7. And now uh, the idea can be seen because white plays d5. Uh, very thematic idea, trying to isolate this weak uh, f pa pawn uh, and kind of try to make the use of the slight lead in development and the fact that this knight kind of can't, it will take some time to get it into play, which is a very typical at maybe higher levels, but not so at, let's say, club level. And the point is after ed5, obviously we don't want to take with the queen because queen d5, queen d5, ed5, knight f5 uh, leads, leads to some trouble because uh, white is better developed and we don't have the bishop pair and these pawns might be vulnerable. So that is why ed5 is uh, the move here and after castles. Why well, definitely has a compensation for the pawn. Uh, this double death pawns don't leave impression. The e file is open, but uh, we we also have knight c6 castles long next. So yeah, uh, this is double edged, but objectively I think it is okay for black. And I think this knight g3 idea shouldn't worry us too much. Although once again this position is not super easy to play, but I would say for both sides. But it is up to white to prove the compensation. So that is why. Here, knight c3 is actually far more common. Uh, the idea simply is if c5, d5 immediately without this uh, necessarily preliminary checks with bishop to b5. And once again, this uh, if white achieves this, this is very beneficial for them because now they can play bishop c4, bishop b5, maybe queen d2, queen d2, castle long. And it's very, very difficult for black to kind of develop the pieces because this bishop is restricted, knight c6 is not possible, so this is not the way to go. Um, another move here that white boy can play is bishop to f6. Um, the idea is to play c5 next and then when d5 happens to play e5. But it's debatable how good that is because for example after queen d2, uh, first of all we are uh, mainly because we are uh, moving the same piece twice and losing even more tempi in a position that is already somewhat, you know, rocked for us due to the bad pawn structure. For example queen d2 c5, this is the idea. d5 e5, that's the point. But now after, for example, castles uh, long, it's kind of difficult once again to develop these queen side pieces. And otherwise, where is the king go? Because, you know, bishop c4 or bishop b5, rook e1 is coming quickly. So I'm not sure if this king wants to stay in the center. But after castles h4, yeah, this is a very double-edged position. But I would make an argument that our king is much, much less secure than the opponent's monarch. And uh, yeah, like d6 might come at some point, bishop c4, knight to d5 might come. And even if it is not like immediately lost for black, I think practically this is quite unpleasant. Um, because, you know, we are under the attack and, and we it's difficult to play these positions when you are not fully developed for black. So I think there's a reason why there are more popular ways of handling this variation than this bishop f6 move. Although it is an idea and if you are playing this with white, you should be aware of these things. So. Another point here that I want to make is, uh, the main, since the main move here is a6 with the idea of playing b5 bishop to b7. That's like kinda the uh, the main and critical move in, of this entire variation. But in order to understand why that, let's just understand that b6 uh, with a very similar idea of playing bishop to b7 is not so good. Because then again, this whole d5 business happens, for example, bishop c4, bishop b7, d5. And now 
with the bishop on c4 uh, and our bishop on b7, e6 is now in trouble. And we really, really, we don't want to take on d5 and like isolate these two pawns. Uh, not uh, b because this here, it doesn't even win a pawn here. So we, we really don't want to permit it. And this is not something to be recommended for black. So that is why the a6 is a move. Uh, the idea is to play bishop to b5, uh, sorry, b5 and bishop to b7 with a gain of tempo. And the point is that after bishop to c4 here, uh, we immediately have the move b5 here. And now if bishop to b3, we already have c5. And this is a much, much better version because c4 is now a threat. And uh, yeah, white can't play like this. So this, remember this idea, this is the main uh, point of this whole a6 stuff. Now, of course, uh, white has some other options. So first thing that's important to understand here is what if d5 never to s? Because wait, white has played knight c3, the queen is on d1, why not d5? Well, here, we are, the bishop is not on c4, our bishop is on c8, protecting e6 square. So here we can play c6, adding more pressure on the d5 uh, pawn, and also exploiting the fact that our knight is still on b8. And now, for example, after d takes e6, it's probably better to take on e6 than on c6. We exchange queens and play bishop e6. And yes, we now have these isolated pawns, but this is a little bit of a better version because we have a relatively full end development. Uh, probably knight d7 castles long uh, is coming. And uh, yeah, bishop pair is now a little bit more relevant in this open position, even though probably white can play knight d4 and take this bishop. But I think black should objectively be fairly fine because the open g file and the bishop pair compensate for the pawn structure. Although if you don't like this, here are other options such as b5 is possible or even bishop f6 is possible. So it's, there are multiple ways to treat this position, but I do think c6 is kind of the cleanest and objective with the best. Other move here that's fairly popular is the move a4. Uh, it's sensible. Okay, I, I just want to prevent this b5 point. But now uh, we switch to the other plan because after bishop f6, for example, uh, queen d2, c5, uh, d5 uh, castles. Okay, we can also start with e5. But basically the main point is uh, that now this plan with bishop f6, e5 and castle is short makes a lot of sense because after castles, castles long, the fact that white has committed his pawn to a4 ma makes their king much less secure and we can immediately exploit this by playing b5 blasting open the position immediately. So this is a very common theme. I have also like uh, benefited from this theme in, 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 in some chapters of my modern defense course on chessable. So basically we don't mind giving up a pawn just to open up the a file for the rook and get closer to this king. And now we know white's uh, uh, attack with h4, rook h3 is much, much slower and this is much more double edged. And uh, even though black's attacking chances shouldn't be overestimated, like it's not an automatic win, I don't think this is something that black wants, uh, white wants in this variation. And here also it's important to know that now it's kind of too late to switch, because if you want to switch to g3, then after c5 there is no d5 any longer, because bishop c3 just means this pawn on d5 and also ruins the structure. So this is one of the advantages of having the bishop pair, you can give it up at the appropriate moment. So this a4 idea is not particularly good. Uh, queen d2 is another possibility, and that's a very, very common way of playing this variation, you know, just going for castle swung. So now we play b5, castle swung. Uh, you can't play d5 still because of b4, by the way, so don't do that. Um, so after castle swung, now we play queen d6. Now this is a very important moment because bishop b7 runs into d5, and now our Knight, uh, now our pawn on e6 is not protected. So for example, if we play, I don't know, c6 here, then d takes e6, queen d2, rook d2, f6, rook e2, king e7, g4, uh, very, very, very powerful move, uh, preparing bishop to g2, uh, preparing knight e5, and this is horrible for, for, for black because, yeah, we have the bishop pair, but this bishop is locked, and we are getting blasted open in the center, and we are in significant trouble as black here, knight e5 is coming, this is not good. And also uh, here before is kind of tricky because there is a, a very similar version of the peace sacrifice, uh, bishop c4, b takes c3, queen c3. So not only is d6 threatened, uh, hello to the queen, rook on g, uh, ag8 is threatened, and if, I don't know, e5, the only move, knight e5. Yeah, white has two pawns for the peace, but ongoing initiative, we are undeveloped. Uh, 
Rook is still kinda eyed, uh, yeah, knight c6 maybe comes. I would really, really not want to play this as black. So yeah, this is like a very important moment, because if we are playing this variation with a6, after queen d2, b5 castles long, we have to remember this move queen, uh, queen to d6. Also note that knight d7, for example, is solid uh, and maybe more secure than queen d6. Uh, uh, but here the idea is to after d5 to play e5 under these circumstances uh, and after queen e3 we play bishop e7 now and now after d5 we have bishop to c5 which is kind of unnatural but maybe kind of saves the day for for black but still like i don't think this is very very uh intuitive uh for 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 black and i think queen d6 is the the, the let's say the easiest quote unquote the idea of this move is to bring the queen in front prepare knight d7 maybe bishop b7 and also to be able to uh, play uh, e5 in response to d5 because the queen on d6 is covering the e5 square. So for example, after queen to e3, uh, <coughs> excuse me, so this is actually quite thematic because the queen opens up the d-file to i the queen on d6, and now we play knight d7, and now after there is this d5 pawn sacrifice, uh, and here we have to play knight b6. Uh, unfortunately, e5 would be sensible, but after bishop b5, a b5, knight b5, it turns out that black is losing. Once again, whether your opponents will be able to see this, I don't know. The point is that you can't really move the queen here or here because then uh, white exchanges and take on c7 with the fork. So this is not particularly good. So we have to find this knight b6 move. And after dx6, uh, uh, queen e6, this is apparently fine for black. There is some repetition of moves available. You can see it in the notes, but I would stop here. So, uh, yeah, like how, how, uh, how many people will be know this queen e3 uh, I, idea, I don't know. Because if, if white doesn't do that and they play like d5 here, then we play e5. And now we, the center is closed and we have easy game, bishop b7, knight d7. And things can go wrong for white very, very, very quickly actually. Which is why I really, really like this variation, even though there is some risk. And you need to know some stuff. Like this is one of those variations uh, that you kind of need to remember when studying opening theory. I mean, most people who play this with, with white, they just play routinely, kind of normal developing moves. And if they do that, then you have good chances of seizing the initiative. Now, of course, uh, not all people do that, and people who actually know what they are doing will probably play the move g3 here. Uh, people who don't know what they are doing will also might find it, but uh, people who know what they are doing will not only know the move, but also the repercussions that arise uh, uh, from it. So the idea is once again to get the bishop to g2, castle short, and then to at some point play d5 at a good moment. So here we should go with b5. And now after bishop to g2, bishop b7 castles, black has a very big choice uh, between reckless play and uh, <laughs> less reckless play. So actually, I was preparing this variation at some point, and there is this very interesting move, very thematic move, the move c5, striking in the center immediately. And at first glance, it works wonderfully for, for black, because if d takes c5, then we take on d1 and take on c5, like we have seen this idea. This is absolutely not problematic for black, the bishop pair open position, wonderful. But the problem is that there is this d5 move here. And if b4, which seems the, like the refutation, because now the knight is under the attack, and when the knight moves, we take on d5 very gladly. But the problem is that there is this move d takes c6 here, b takes c3, e takes f7, and now you can't take with the king here because then, for example, takes uh, knight e5 comes, bishop e7 happens, this is a disaster. So you have to play king f8, and now queen to e2 happens. Uh, and uh, yeah, like rook d1 is coming, rook e1 is coming. And even though, you know, we have uh, extra piece and this pawn is kind of hanging, for the moment we are not developed, our pawn structure is a mess, our king is exposed, and... Um, and uh, yeah, it's not so easy actually to get that second pawn, so white currently has two pawns for the piece. Now, of course, the computer will say black can uh, hold balance with accurate play, uh, and apparently have chance, winning chances if white is not careful, because the position is responsible for both sides. Uh, but it is, you know, quite risky to go for a variation like this, without absolutely denying, and it is a little bit more difficult to play as black. And actually, when I was preparing for my game against Arthur Der Winter, 
I was considering going here, but I thought, okay, no, this is too risky, especially since he is a very tactical player who has played this quite some time. I do think that without careful analysis and very good memory, it's very risky to go for this. Well, one wrong move and you are dead. So you really, really need to know what you are doing. But fortunately, also so does White. And at the end of the day, you are a piece up. Once again, this is for the brave. Play at your own risk. Fortunately, we are not forced to play this. And here we can play a little bit more quietly, like play castles here. And now there are some options for white. For example, in one game between two Serbian grandmasters, uh, Perunovic and Sedva, Queen e2 was played, preparing rook d1. This is a very natural move. Uh, done c5, d takes c5, bishop c5, rook a d1. And here in the game, queen f6 was played, trying to activate the queen on, on a relatively active diagonal, although queen e7 was also possible. And actually in, the, in this game between Perunovic and Sedlak, black actually went on to win. Although probably white is slightly better here and the sample of games is so small that this is by no means like a conclusive verdict about the viability of this variation and... So on. I, it doesn't seem like black has too many problems. I think knight c6 might come next, but still, not like uh, you know, white is also very solid. Their st pawn structure is better, and they are still ahead in development. Uh, the other way of playing peer here is knight to e5. Uh, you know, activating the knight and trying to eliminate black's bishop pair. But after bishop to uh, g2, king to g2, this is probably a little bit balanced. Uh, why does have a better structure, but this piece is very, very, very powerful. And uh, yeah, we, we can play c5 at some point. We do need to first solve a little bit the problem of this development, but we can play maybe bishop f6, uh, maybe queen d6 and so on. And all in all, I think that uh, even if white has something that's very, very, very small and probably, you know, the position is as it usually goes, balanced, equal, and the player who will play better from this on will win and if both players play well they will the game will be draw. Now as we have just seen, when black commits to f5 and the knight goes to c3, there are certain problems or valid variations or yeah complications that result from this uh, idea of white pushing d5 at the right moment. So therefore the right question to ask here is okay but what if black doesn't do so? What if black keeps the knight on e4? and tries to do something similar, but with not committing to f5 just as yet, or maybe committing to it at the better moment. And indeed, this is the other big way of playing this position, and generally you could make an argument that the point of this position basically resorts to setups where black plays f5 and setups where black doesn't. Uh, and the most common way of doing so here, or playing without f5, is to play the move a6. Now. Uh, you might be wondering, okay, why not b6? As you might recall, uh, with bishop uh, with f5 knight c3, the move bishop c4 was problematic when Im immediate d5 happens. And here we have something similar, like after bishop c4, already d5 is on the cards, bishop b7, now queen to e2. And now, for example, after knight to d7, there is uh, castles uh, long, and already you can see that d5 is very, very annoying, so uh, our king is kind of caught in the center, the queen uh, on the d-file might run into some issues, and we kind of have to play c6 to prevent d5. But if we have to play c6 and kill our bishop, that is horrible, uh, and now after rook to h to e1, white has a very, very easy game, uh, more space, uh, our bishop pair is for the moment irrelevant, we can so easily get in c5, uh, okay, maybe we can, uh, maybe we can, yeah, I don't know, generate some play with, I'm not even sure how actually, because white can also play bishop a6 if they want to, so yeah, this is not to be recommended. So, now after a6, uh, white once again has a lot of options. I have to mention, uh, it is a little bit curious, uh, you know, to leave the knight on e4, because yes, on one hand we are not forcing it to, let's say, a good square c3, but on e4 it is influencing the center, it is controlling c5 square, and in some variations where we play b5, the knight can actually jump to c5 more actively. So, for example, uh, here, by the way, if a4, we play f5, and that's probably the best way, because as we have seen there, uh, that variation where white uh, plays a, um, a4, for example, of the knight c3, is pretty acceptable for us, uh, 
because we can play, for example, bishop f6, here we'll castle short, and uh, then there is this whole c5 stuff going on. Uh, this is good, and we have managed to avoid the dangerous variations where uh, white plays without a4 and plays like for d5, or plays g3, bishop g2, and then d5, and so on. Now, there are some other options here for, for, for uh, white. For example, th now that the knight is not on c3, this move c4 is possible, gaining more space, uh, preventing b5. Uh, but it turns out that this might be beneficial for black because this po c pawn can be used as a hook to open up the queen side in the future. So now we play f5, knight c3, and otherwise bishop b4, by the way, because now with the c like if you go knight g3, then bishop b4, and it's, it's super bad for white. So knight c3, and now we play bishop f6. So uh, you might be wondering, okay, but with c4 and knight c3, d5 is kind of good, but d5, c5, and we are not at all sad here. That's why queen d2 is more common, and now we play c5, d5, castles, castles, one, e5, we get a position like this. And uh, with the pawn on c2, this would be a little bit annoying because this bishop could come, for example, at c4 or so on. Uh, and also it's more difficult to generate the attack for black. But with now with the pawn on c4, b5 will be a thing. And once again, similarly as in those lines where the pawn was on a4, we will be able to open up the queen side, which will foster uh, and allow us to make, uh, to have some attacking chances. Especially if at the right moment we also play e4, open up this bishop and so on and so forth. Once again, not necessary to play like this. You can also play like bishop to g7. Uh, this, the idea is to take on d5 without getting hit with knight d5. For example, h4, e d5, knight d5, knight c6. Um, this is here it's also relevant that white has played c4 because you know pawns don't move backward and d4 now is in our hands. And yes, we have the horrible pawn structure, but we do have the bishop pair and some nice active pieces. So uh, once again, this is probably balanced and not, you know, objectively better for white, at least from the opening theory standpoint. Still a lot of chess to be played, of course, but that's <laughs> pretty much usual. So, yeah, like, you have a choice here once again. You go e5 or you go bishop to g7. But all in all, I don't think this c4 idea is particularly dangerous for black. Uh, what else is there? Now, bishop c4 is horrible here, because now we play b5, bishop b3, and now we go f5. And once again, c5 comes on the next move, almost no matter what happens, knight g3, c5, or knight c3, c5, and once again, d5 is not possible because c4 wins a piece. So this idea of timing f5 better is, is pretty, pretty, pretty good. Also note, by the way, here that we don't lose anything because after knight to c5, we can simply take, uh, take d1 and then play against this pawn, for example, I don't know, bishop b7, I dis like something like this, for example. Uh, pretty okay position for black. Uh, this is permanent weakness and we are almost uh, to be preferred here. So that's also not particularly good. Uh, what else is there? Uh, black can also play, uh, sorry, I'm constantly mixing white and black. White can also play queen to d2 here. Uh, but now going for this queen set castling in this version with the pawn on uh, f6 is not too good because after f uh, b5 castles, bishop b7. Uh, this is not so good because if you remember in this position there was d5 but here uh, without uh, f5 knight c3 being played d5 is not so good and for example with queen to e3 then we play knight to d7 adding some control to the c5 square and if knight c5 uh, attacking uh, the bishop and okay inviting white to take here and to open the rook we don't of course do that but we play bishop d5 and we got everything covered. It's very, very difficult, almost impossible to kick this bishop away for the moment. We want to maybe take, play c6, and then just take it from there. So that is why here actually bishop d2 is more common, but then we still play bishop d5 and c6. And yeah, we are kind of happy for the moment. We will keep the king in the center behind this solid uh, construction. Uh, yeah, and next then we can try to play on the queen side. We, at some point we also want to activate this rook potentially, but basically we haven't weakened this pawn shield in front of the king, and I don't know, maybe knight b6 happens next, maybe queen a5 or something on this line, maybe pushing the pawns. Uh, black is not better, but neither are we worse, and yeah, this is a pretty acceptable and non-standard position where both sides have chances. 
So yeah, this routine play with queen d2, it was obviously a little bit debatable even uh, with f5 knight c3 included, but here it's particularly not good because we haven't moved this pawn. Once again, which is why there is, there is a big debate for and against the move f5. Uh, what else is there? There's also bishop to d3, but it blocks the d file and it's kind of meh. For example, now we play f5, as we have avoided more dangerous setups with the bishop on c4. So you see, in many of these cases, we don't really avoid f5, we merely delay it uh, in order to avoid certain dangerous lines. And now once again, it's kind of c5 is ha happening, for example, knight g3 c5 already is good, uh, knight c3, uh, we can play b5, uh, queen e2 c5, for example. Uh, and if knight d2 d2, we play c5 nevertheless, and d c5, queen a5, it's all pretty, pretty good for black, and we have no problems in a position like this. Which finally brings me to the main and more, most dangerous move here, the move g3. Just like in the variations where f5, knight c3 was included, this is very, very sensible. Since black is trying to get the bishop on b7, white tries to do the same, and I, the... Along the diagonal, potentially invite the exchange of the bishops and eliminate black's bishop pair at the right moment. So we play b5 here. Once again, I'm not 100% sure whether it's better to play b5 or include this and then transpose to the lines with f5. But uh, I'm starting to think that in this case it probably is the best approach because after bishop to g2, bishop to b7, once again, probably f5 is the last chance to go here, because after bishop to b7, queen to e2, now we no longer, like, we, we are annoyed here, because this knight is preventing us from playing c5, and if f5, the knight can still go there and open up the d-file. So, for example, if we play f5 here, knight c5, uh, bishop takes c5, d takes c5, okay, this looks, pawn looks kind of weak, but, I mean, there are some queen e5 ideas, and we are a little bit undeveloped for this opening of the position. The main line continues bishop e4, castles knight c6. Um, it, uh, the engine claims black can kind of hold, and that is not so clear, but first of all, this is very inhuman to play, and uh, yeah, secondly, white even objectively retains the advantage, even though this pawn is somewhat weak. Uh, Possible to handle it like this, but once again, not maybe most practical and definitely not most, most intuitive way of playing. Uh, some strong French defense players, so like uh, Vitugov, Short and Morozevic, who play this a lot as black, especially Alexander Morozevic, he, he loved this variation, this burn variation. They play knight d7 here, which is sensible, controlling c5 and preparing f5. And after castles f5, you might think, okay, the knight has to go to c3, we play c5, always good. Well, no, knight c5 is still possible. Because if you try to, like, get this pawn with either bishop c5, d c5, knight c5, or, or if you take with the bishop, there is this annoying double attack, queen e5, hitting the rook, hitting the pawn on c5, and, yeah, resigns here, is the best move. So, we have to kind of swallow the pill and go for something like knight c5, d c5, and now, for example, bishop to f6, uh, you know, getting the b bishop active on this diagonal, we will castle soon, and also preparing queen e7 as a response to rook d1. And after rook d1, queen e7, there is b4. And I'm not sure, like, white can at any moment play knight e5 and get rid of the bishop pair. Uh, there, there are some defects in white's pawn structure, but also how do you go about exploiting them, and also there are defects in our own structure. So, maybe it is a little bit of a matter of taste, I mean, black maybe has equalizing chances with castles and rook d1, but I'm not 100% sure if this is the way to play this variation, this whole burn variation. I would, uh, I if we go back to all the way to like, uh, you know, this, vari this moment here, I think if you kind of know that you would end up in, 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 a, in a relatively passive position such as this one, maybe it's better to actually swallow the pill and either go for f5 and then uh, and then here uh, after a6, g3, like in this critical variation to, to either learn this peace sacrifice line or to play castles. Uh, once again, that would be my taste and uh, maybe somebody would disagree, but I have a feeling if you want to play something solid, uh, then maybe it's better to like play knight b to d7 here, as will be examined in the other video. Of course, some of you might disagree, it is largely a matter of taste, as it is always in these openings, but my feeling is, if I play the burn variation with bishop to e7, 
I generally try to avoid the potential where I end up in somewhat passive position with where I have to defend. I'm playing it with more ambitious ambition than that. Uh, although, once again, it kind of also depends how much does your opponent know. With, because objectively, probably in any opening, uh, why to have some way to either have a safe advantage or, or even objective advantage, but only if they know the best move. As we have seen in this uh, chapter, there are quite a few intricacies associated with this a6 and delaying f5. And if your opponent doesn't know the most critical lines and the best approach, then maybe uh, it is worth not playing f5. So there is something to be said for either approach, but all in all, I think the burn variation is a very tricky, very combative, very non-standard and very still underestimated variation uh, that is even played at the top level and that I feel that at the club level it can do wonderful results because many, many white players don't actually devote that much time to its study. And this brings me to the end of this video devoted to the burn variation and with it we have also covered the entire 4 bishop g5 variation of the classical French. We will be continuing uh, our uh, coverage of different openings, most notably of the French defense in the next uh, opening videos, which I don't know when they will come, but stay tuned for that. Uh, if you haven't, feel free to check some of the previous videos devoted to other variations of the French defense. And as usual, uh, the materials covered in this video, both in the written form and in the form of the freely available uh, Witcher study and also PGN file are available. So the links will be provided below in the description. You can also download the material for free. Uh, if you want, uh, yeah, I would really appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel or share the video, help spread the world. It takes a lot of time to create these videos and also these files. And also, if you want, you can consider uh, buying me a coffee because I want to keep this going, uh, but I also want to keep it donation-based. So it is not obligated, but every little bit helps me to keep, keep creating this content and keep creating these opening files and videos. But that's all for this commercial break. I would really, really appreciate you if you managed to stick uh, until the end. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you for watching and bye.